Friday, we have another incredible guest here for Behind the Seams by Just Baseball Media. Uh, Justin Anderson, who pitched with the Angels and has pitched with the Royals for a little bit. Uh, 14th rounder in the 2014 MLB draft. Uh, Justin, how are you doing today? Doing great. Can't really complain. Monday, ready to get the week started. Love it. Love it. Yeah. So the first question I always ask guys, uh, just because a lot of times like guys with Angels fans, they probably know who you are, but for like the general baseball audience, they might not know uh, who you are. So from your angle, just give us a little bit of background on yourself and your story into professional baseball. Yeah. So, I mean, growing up here in Houston, you know, it's kind of a hotbed already when, when you're in Texas, you know, it's just either kind of play baseball or you kind of play football or you do both, honestly. So I played football as a kid growing up too and baseball. And then once I got into high school, like I quit playing after my freshman year and kind of just focused on baseball then. And I was like, all right, this is kind of where I can see myself succeeding at or whatnot. I got a couple of, a uh, couple looks from some pro teams. Then I was like, okay, so I can really like pursue this as a career more so as a dream really at the time, you know? And then, then I went to UTSA for three years, got drafted in the 14th round there by the angels. And I was with them all the way up until 2020. And I debuted with them in 2018. The end of 2020 happened. They non-tendered me and whatnot. And then I w signed a two-year deal with Texas. That was great. Uh, part of that two-year deal was they allowed me to do my rehab with them. I was I had mm -hmm. Tommy John in July of 2020. And they allowed me to pretty much do that whole year of rehab in 21. And then I pitched probably about a month and a half at the end of the year, part of August and September with them. And then going into 22 was supposed to be like, you know, my big like kind of breakout break out back into a year, I guess is yeah. the kind of way of saying it. And I had a subscap injury that kind of lingered around and tried to come back in July of 22 from that and didn't really go up this thing's planned and kind of just shut down after that. And it was, it was, last year was really hard trying to, trying to get a job. I didn't, I did not sign with Kansas city till, you know, the beginning of June. So I was able to finally get a job with, with the team and pitch with Kansas city. They, they put me in Arizona for, you know, for the, about two months is what it was, and then they finally had a spot open up in Double A, and I had to I needed to continue to pitch just for the sake of playing and get back to where I needed to get to. And then at the end of the season, I uh, had entered free agency. Yeah, it, one thing I noticed about your story is a lot of adversity, right? Of having to overcome those injuries. Yeah. Um, a lot of times when you have those injuries too, right? It kind of feels like you're on an island, right? Uh, mm -hmm. What did you do, or who did you reach out to to get support, and how did you kind of overcome those moments? Honestly, like the Angels had a really good mental skills coach that mm -hmm. I was able to connect with quite a bit. And me and him have a really good relationship still to this day. And I, we talk all the time still. But I think just having him there as a soundboard was 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 a big thing for me. And he was really good about just giving me my space. And I think that was one of the most important things about him and him learning me and me learning him was – he was never a guy that was pressing on, pressing on. He would present you with small challenges, and then he kind of just let you let you be. And still to our day, to this day, our relationship's kind of like that. He's not much of a presser, and then he always knows, like, if I need something, I'm going to call him, and our relationship picks up back where it was, which is great. So I'm very thankful for that. But he was probably one of the biggest soundboards that I had at that time. And then when I was with Texas, it was just kind of like there was a bunch of – there was actually a few of us rehabbing from Tommy John. It was, I think, three of us in that group. And so we all kind of just were with each other, talk about things yeah. we felt and whatnot. And you talk to other guys around the league or other, other guys you've played with for sure, like about their experiences and how it was. And it's so, it's so interesting how everyone's so different with their experience. You know, some guys, you know, have speed bumps, some guys go straight through some guys, you know, right when about to get started in the throwing or whatever, just something happens and it comes up. So when, with stuff like that, I feel like just having the, the rehab, the, the right rehab guys around you, the leaders that you had around you. Like I had two uh, rehab coaches with us and, you know, they were awesome too. Cause you know, he's, they've seen these uh, TJ rehabs for so, so many years now. It's, it's almost, it's almost like routine as, as weird as that is to say, you know, yeah. you don't ever hear that, but it, it just becomes kind of routine to them and they can, they became my ne my next soundboard when I was there. I saw them every day, obviously. So, being able to feed back off of them, ask them certain questions of where it was in a certain phase or whatnot, you know, I think having them two helped me out a lot in the most outside of uh, the mental skills coach that I still use from Anaheim.
Yeah. Uh, the one thing I loved that you touched on about the mental skills coach is like he gave you like these assignments, but he put the power and the control and like to you. Yeah. Right. I think yes. when you were doing a lot of that mindset stuff, you really have to like put the control into the person who's going through mm -hmm. whatever they're going through, because uh, you don't want to come in there and be like telling them what's wrong or telling them that they're doing right. this and that. And, and it, a lot of that mindset stuff, you really want that individual to have that control over their own uh, destiny. No, definitely. Like in 2018 too, he'd ask, he'd ask some like really hard, interesting questions that would actually make you think. And they were the questions where, dang, I don't know what I would do, say to that or what I would do in the situation. So when I look back at stuff like that, it's now it's like, I actually, I have the answers to that stuff now, mm. which I always yeah. thought was kind of funny. I tell my wife that all the time. It's like, <laughs> it's like, I have the answers to some of those questions that I didn't have when I was 25 years old. You know, I, maybe I had those answers, you know, two, two years later, or, you know, I got some of those answers just recently, a few months ago and stuff like that. So I think, I think having that was, was very beneficial for me. Yeah. I love it. PJ, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, yeah, so you're touching on, you know, really taking advantage of mental skills coach and stuff like, mm -hmm. like that and how important that was for you. Was that important to you, you know, pre-injury, pre-rehab, you know, before that process? Was that something that you thought about a lot or kind of took really seriously? Or was it until you, you know, hit that sort of speed bump with the injuries to where you were like, okay, I got to, you know, dive more into this side of it? Right. No, I was kind of bought into it right like right when he came on board i think then 18 was actually the first year the angels had somebody mm. um as a mental skills coach and it was it was hard for him too because they had him from doing top to bottom you know so mm. that part of it on him i'm sure it was hard but he it was just like something that i never had before so i was like okay i, I need to be open-minded to this and really try to see where i can get you know some value information on and become a better better baseball player, a better teammate, and a better person overall. And I think just having that brought to me and then having the open mind of becoming more vulnerable in a sense of I'm usually not a vulnerable person. And I would definitely say over the past five years, I've become way more vulnerable to stuff like that just because of the experience before. And then especially when, when you get into the big league, like you just, there's, you have to talk to somebody more about certain situations and like guy like him have somebody present you with those those hard hitting questions about you know what's going to happen and what do you think is going to happen in two months or what are you going to do in two years where you where will this be or what would you say if I asked you this you know questions like that I def so I think me having that open minded early before injury and stuff helps me out a ton in rehab because I still tell people to this day and I'll tell you all right now that Tommy John rehab me having TJ was one of the best experiences of my life. Not it's not even close, and I don't even think it's comparable to anything because there was a lot of good that came out of it. I came out of it a better person. I came out of it a dad. You know, I had we conceived my first child, and I had my first daughter in November. And I'm talking like I have multiple kids. I have only one kid, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, those are some of the positives that came that came out of it. You know, so I was really blessed and fortunate to be able just to be like buy into it at that time and continue to keep growing in that aspect. Definitely. Yeah, no, that's awesome to hear because, I mean, once you got called up, they kind of threw you in there in the fire. They didn't really ease yeah. you in there. I think it was, what, 57 games in 2018 and then 50 yep. plus again in 2019. Mm -hmm. So you didn't even really get eased into it. So the fact that, you know, you were already prepared for that kind of stuff and thinking about it. Exactly. Uh, I'm sure that was huge. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, always talk about the way I got thrown in, thrown into the situation in my debut is like, you get thrown into a situation where they're the reigning World Series champs, 25 years old, and I came into the game in a two-run lead. I knew I was going to probably pitch that day because the day before, it was a cr just some crazy stuff had happened with our pitching in the bullpen. I remember the starter got into a spot where he had an at-bat with a guy who was 21 pitches, so like his pitch count just shot up immediately in the second mm -hmm. inning. And he like, and you go look back at his stats, it like, wasn't even one of those things that was a bad inning. It was like, dude, your pitch count just got too high from – one inning really and then they had to run the bullpen after that a guy got hurt warming up in the middle of the game to go in they had to bring it they had to warm up another guy so it's kind of one of the situations where, like i knew i was going to pitch that night it was just maybe when and where and i'm yeah. sure obviously ideally they want it to be maybe like a five six seven nothing lead not you know a two nothing lead in division game but you know here i was i got thrown into that fire right away and i think that was one of the best things that could ever happen to me was 
So it should just be like, he's got to sink or swim and we're going to see what happens. And then same thing happened the next night. I had never thrown back to back in my entire life. <laughs> never. And next thing I know, so she's got me in there in a situation. I think it's this probably the seventh inning. It was one of Otani's third, I think third or fourth start and came in. He had a little bit of traffic on bases on base. And I came in, kind of helped us out, get out of that spot. I think I surrendered one run in that situation. So being able to just to do those two situations right there and then come into the dugout, look back at the score room, be like, all right, you like you kept us in the lead. Like that's ultimately your goal as a pitcher. You come yeah. out of the game with a lead, you you did your job. So being able to do that at 25 years old as a rookie and come in the next day and be like, all right, I'm still here. We can keep doing this, you know, and there's a lot. You see the the picture starts becoming bigger. It's like, man, I can do this, you know. So I was thankful for that too. Yeah, just yeah. confidence right off the bat. Easily, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I have to imagine that's a huge part of it, right? Because, like, you think about – a lot of guys they'll go on to the mound or they'll go up to bat up to the plate already thinking, Oh, I'm going to fail in this situation. Right. This is mm-hmm. a lot of things that I teach uh, kids that I coach. I coach 16 right. year olds and it's a lot of them are already going up to the plate and they're like, I'm going to fail. They mm-hmm. already have that mindset. And so when you go up with that mindset, it's like, how, how do you get yourself out of it? If you have those negative thoughts going through your head, right. I'm sure that's like a lot of what you worked on with a mental skills coach too. Definitely. No, if, if you have to go in, it's almost like the visualization side of it. It's like, yeah. you have to prepare to, you have to prepare yourself in the situation of like, I am going to do this. I will do this. I can do like this. So that's the, that's one of the biggest things. Like if you can see, sometimes you can really see things and visualize it, visualize, you can make it actually happen. Yeah. And there's times where it does happen. And you know, there's times it doesn't because guess what? We're human beings. And that's just, that's just the nature of the game, especially, you know, we, it's a, it's the running joke of, you know, baseball, you're going to fail 70% of the time, but that 30% of the time you're in the hall of fame. <laughs> So yeah. it's just, oh, yeah. you know, this is that small little baseball nuance that holds true. Yeah. And I mean, you look, you talk about visualization, Clayton Kershaw, one of the greatest to do it. He's out mm-hmm. there visualizing his starts. He'll go into the bullpen and oh, yeah. before he has an actual start and like pretend and like reenact what he's planning to come and do. Yeah. It's up. like, I remember when, I think it was when Scherzer and the Nationals were in the World Series that year. He didn't he go on the mound right after they just... Uh, did the shake hand line yeah so yeah that was something he did and obviously it worked they won the world series that year the guy went out on the mound he was out there for maybe no more than what looked like 30 seconds and then boom he was good to go yeah it's insane some of those things mm-hmm. uh, the one thing you mentioned dude, I, that i thought was interesting uh, you talked about how like tommy john um, was one of the best experiences of your life right a lot of people mm-hmm. would probably take the mindset oh this is a huge setback in my career i can't believe i'm going through this right. what led you to that mindset because i think that's huge for one overcoming the tommy john and having to go through that adversity right you're taking the positive mm-hmm. that come that comes with it um, and you can kind of tell that it helped you really find your identity identity outside of baseball right you talked about having a kid you talked about all these other things that were going on that were great in your life so mm-hmm. What went into your mindset when you decided to take that route and take that positive route with it? Well, what had happened, it was, you know, I, I was in there with uh, Meister and he, he gives you all the options. He's like, I give you all the options because you have the ultimate choice whether you want to do it. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> we already had the surgery set up and I kind of joked with him. I'm, he's like, but these are your options. I just joked with him. I'm like, I'm like, it, it's cut. Like it, it, there's a, there's a clear cut. Like it, it's, we're doing this, you know? So I kind of laugh at that because it's like we're, we we have to do this and kind of just going through the rehab. It's like I, I was put in I was put in a really good spot. I had great people around me throughout the entire process. You know, it was it was COVID year two, so I wasn't allowed to be at the stadium because I was taking up a tier spot, and we only had sixty tier one spots allowed, and I was taking that spot up. So I had I had to come home and do all my rehab away from the team. Well, I was ver- very lucky that. A guy I did PT with back when I was 14 years old, still doing the same thing over over here in Houston. So they set me up with him, and he's done plenty of TJs throughout his uh, physical therapy career too. So it was like it was kind of a no brainer. I already had a relationship with the guy. You know, he works with Houston on the side. He had worked with Houston in I think it was 2018. You know, I, I remember debuting, and I think it was that next day, one of those next days. He was like, "Dude, come out, meet me at home plate real quick. Let's let's talk." And you know that I got to see him, talk to him, and whatnot. So that was awesome. And working with him for those six months that I was home was, you know, that like I said, it was just amazing having that familiar face 
that I'd already seen once before that I already worked with so many other guys in the same situation. And the other side of it too was it just allowed me to slow down. It just yeah. it, it totally put put everything on a big pause for me to just basically just kind of let loose and breathe again. It just be like this is this is your you know this is your life for sure the next six months. You're not picking up a baseball. You're gonna just rehab your elbow. You're gonna do a ton of arm care, <laughs> ton of arm care, and then you're like you're lifting. And when you're lifting during the Tommy John process, it's it's just like you're eating weights every single day. That that's all yeah. I did. And you just keep building up, building up, building up. And as you're doing that, the weights are going up. You're getting stronger. You're getting bigger. Like that's kind of all it is. And you're just you're you're eating nonstop too. So that was one of the best things I think that allowed me. It's allowed me to get stronger in different parts of my body all over again in a way that maybe I kind of fell down and wasn't really, didn't really notice before. So it allowed me to rebuild everything back up while rebuilding basically a whole new elbow. So that's what gave me that, that uh, outlook on it. And then I was mm-hmm. able to, like I said, work with those, work with the two rehab coaches in Arizona with the Rangers. I mean, they presented some different ideas to me about, throwing once we got into that process as far as like get, getting more so into my legs i didn't really use my legs enough i didn't have them unlocked i guess is a better way of saying everything moved well everything was fluid but they allowed me to become more fluid more of that uh what's the word more more whippy ish and maybe when i throw it yeah. now it doesn't look whippy but the feel of it to me is like more whip it more whippy and more rubber band like like more violent at the end so mm-hmm. i think just Going about that and understanding that I had to change something in my delivery, in my throwing program, that was the other big side of it too. It's like you have to – something has to change somewhere in your throwing, in your whether it's your prehab or your post-hab. It's like something somewhere needed to change. And the throwing side of it is one of the biggest things that helped me change a lot. Yeah, I love that. I'll turn over to PJ here in a second for another question. But the one thing mm-hmm. I really like that you touched on is that point of slowing down. I think that's kind of a lesson for life and for Jeez. everyone, right? Mm-hmm. Because like we're always thinking we got to be on the fast track to get that promotion or we're going to be on the fast right. track to be, be at a certain stage in life. And I think having that ability to slow down and step back um, is just huge because I we had interviewed Mark Appel and he talked about mm-hmm. like from the moment he was drafted, he felt like he was supposed to be on this fast train to for the big sure. leagues. And then yeah. every ma- moment of failure that hit it was like a setback right it was a setback mm-hmm. it was a career he never felt like he could slow down even Definitely. with those failures because those failures just like weighed over him like and that's why oh, yeah. he eventually le- left baseball for a little bit mm-hmm. before he came back yeah that was really cool he came back and then he finally gets to yeah. at least make his debut definitely yeah. really cool yeah uh pj i'll turn it over to you again uh yeah just going back to you talking about you know uh the rehab process when you said that you had to go back home and do it at first. I was like, Oh, whoa. Like that's like, I don't like, I don't know how I would have taken that, but the more I thought about it, it it was probably kind of nice, you know, to be home, you know, this, this big moment happening, but you Mm -hmm. know, you get to be around your family and stuff. And cause I've seen a lot of guys, you know, kind of get burnt out in rehab when, you know, they're just going to the spring training complex every day and stuff and can get just like, you know, it's just a never ending, like same thing over and over and over again. So, was that helpful to, to be at home, you think? Like just that familiar your a familiarity and stuff like that instead of you know getting burnt out and sort of like extended mm-hmm. spring training. I mean, I, I guess I, I guess I have to say, yeah, it, it definitely did because things have turned out the way they have. And yeah. you know, I was able to come home, sleep in my own bed. I got to see my dogs every day. You know, I have two we have two dogs here that I love and being able just to be in your own home still and you know, I'd wake up and I would go do, I'd go to PT and then I, I'd come home and then around, probably around this time right now, I would do my, you know, in those early stages, I don't know if y'all know, but the early stages of TJ, you're doing PT twice a day. Mm-hmm. So I would come home and, and then we're talking PT, you're talking about just moving your wrist, rotating your arm a little bit. And that's all I was doing for like those first two, probably about, I think it was like two to four weeks if I can remember. So I'd come home and do the rest of my PT and that was, that was it. But it's just the idea of being able to be home, have my family, like you said, my dogs, being able just to still kind of go out of my own neighborhood and just go for a walk and just let be be more free that way. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, it just allowed me to appreciate the game more. Like it made me appreciate the game and fall in love with the game way more than than I than it ever could have. And 
that was one of the biggest things that came out of it too. It allowed me to fall back in love with the game and the passion for the game just came back instantly. And ever since that, it's kind of just been the same. It's like, I don't, I don't want to have to go through something like that again, you know, knock on wood. And it, that, that passion for the game and that fire for the game is still, still inside me. So it's not like it's something that just went away. The Tommy, the mm-hmm. Tommy John rehab definitely brought that back in. That's awesome. And then the next thing I wanted to, to ask you about, you said you stopped playing football in high school. Cause you were like, all right, baseball, I could see myself going far here. Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously when you get drafted, everyone's like, Oh, I'm going to make it to the big leagues. Did you always have that confidence? all the way through the minors and stuff like that. Because from my own personal experience, I view myself as a very confident person, but it would have like ebbs and flows, you know, it'd be like, you'd go through a rough stretch and you're like, man, maybe, maybe I, you know, double A is where, you know, my ceiling is, you know, and stuff like that. Or was that ever just, you were like, there's no doubt in my mind. There, no, like, definitely. I'm getting there. No, definitely. 2017, I hit, I hit what felt like a brick wall. I mean, 16 was a rough year, but it ended on a super high note. I got to go to the Fall League, got to face some unreal competition, played with an unbelievable team, pitched extremely well there, had only one bad game. So thankful for that. And 17, it was like I hit – I feel like I hit a wall. And it was just like – there was no, it was no consistency. It wasn't here, here, here. It was literally just do, 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 nonstop. Mm-hmm. And I remember there was a phone call I had with my agent. probably had a couple of them where it was like, dude, what is going on? What do I – like, what do I need to do? You know, and he kind of just kept saying, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Think, you know, things will eventually work out for us and everything. And, you know, sure enough, they obviously did. But 17 was a hard year as far as baseball wise like that went just be, just for that reason. I, saw, mm-hmm. I remember I, that that was my first year to become a reliever. And they put me back in high A to start the year. And I was pretty bummed about that. But I was like, you know what? This is where you are. If you do, if I remember the manager of the team when after teams got announced in spring training, I was in, I think I was in the weight room doing arm care. And he saw me, and he probably knew I was a little upset for sure. And he he looked to me, and he goes, "Realistically, how long do you think it is before we get you out of here?" And I was like, "A month." And he was like, "He's like exactly." He goes, "Make it a month." And mm-hmm. I made it. I made it ten days instead, which was awesome. Right. And then I was in Double A, and then I was there the rest of the year. And I think that was probably you know a good thing for me. And I think the organization obviously thought that was a good thing for me too, because you know you played it in Double A. It's it is a little, it is a big jump from high A. It's a different type of baseball. It's almost like this is going to sound weird, but it's almost like real baseball. You've seen easy yeah. baseball. You've seen low A and high A. Like double A, it almost turns into like this is real baseball. These are guys, and there's probably about two to three on each team, maybe that are like mm-hmm. these guys ha- are the guys that have real chances of playing in the big leagues or making an impact on a big league team. You know, so. I definitely think that was the year where it was like, man, I was just, I was just fighting myself a lot of times. You know, I played some really good, real good competition in the Southern League in 2017. There you go, know, played against Acuna that year. Uh, one of the, gosh, one of these, one of the big righties from Cincinnati, Aquino, or City's Aquino was in that league oh, too. Yeah. So I played both of those guys a lot. I mean, Jacob Nottingham was in Biloxi that year. Uh, how what's his name Taylor that was that's with Milwaukee too I can't remember his name off oh, top Tyrone. Of my head. Tyrone Taylor Tyrone Taylor yeah. he was in that league yeah. too so I mean there was a lot of big names that I was you know were, were pitching against a lot so just like I said I think the uh being exposed to the fall league that fall before that was probably one of the biggest helps in the world for me and then facing the rest of that competition in double a was because I like I think I just rattled off three guys that played in the big leagues, and I'm sure there was plenty more that I faced. I just can't remember off the top of my head, but those are mm-hmm. those are three names that stuck out to me, or four names that stuck out to me right away. So that year was definitely a trying year. Yeah, I remember those uh, those you know the days in spring training when they'd post all the teams. That was always a, a stressful day waiting for the list to <laughs> yeah. come out. Oh yeah, yeah, you you see guys take it, you know, complete opposites, you know you were a little bummed that you were on the high A roster, but you were like, right. I'm going to make it a month. But then you see other guys where that, that happens to them. And then they start the year in a bad mood. And then one month turns into two months, turns into half a season Definitely. before you get, before you turn around and get moved up. So that's awesome to hear that, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it seems like that's like a theme, the way you attack, you know, TJ, the way you, you took a, uh, you know, a tough 2017 year, the way, you know, your attitude towards, starting the year in high A when you want to be in double A. So it's very commendable. I appreciate it. 
Yeah, the the one question I always ask guys too, just because I think this is a cool human side moment for any guy who makes their their de- major league debut. What was that moment like, right? Because I think you made it in Houston, right where you're from, yeah. as well. Uh, what mm-hmm. was that like? Because I'm sure you had family, friends, everybody in town for it. Oh man, it was pretty surreal. So like, I remember they called me in the office and they told me everything, and everyone's excited for me. The clubhouse, we're all pumped up. I call call my wa- call my wife, call my agent get all that squared away. And then I'm calling like my parents and stuff, calling a couple other family members and close friends. And then I get a text from my wife while I'm doing all this. She's like, y- y'all are in Houston. And it had no idea. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So then I'm finally in touch with the uh, travel secretary. And he's like, we have a flight tomorrow at uh, like, it was like 10 something. So it wasn't terrible. And I would have got in like at one, whatever. And he's like, or we can get you on a flight at, 8 30 tonight and you can get in at it was like 11 something i was like yeah let's do that <laughs> so we did that i get to the hotel my wife had gotten there 10 minutes after i had gotten there too so we we're both at the hotel that day or that night really and then the next day wake up kind of treated it like a normal day really just went and got some breakfast and then went to the yard and being able just to already walk into that clubhouse and be like wow this is this is the clubhouse i didn't think i was going to be in making my debut especially in the town that you grew up in, you know, you grew up watching these games here as a kid and whatnot. And here we are in the visiting clubhouse of the team you watched growing up as a kid. And so, you know, I had probably about 50 or so family and friends there total. It was, it was wild. And, you know, when they finally called, told me to get warmed up, it's like, all right, this is my time. I'm going to the game. And then they, open, we open up the gate and next thing you know, no, they announced my name. So if nobody has a clue who I am, of course, I, I'm just the guy that just showed up there. And all I can hear, I can hear the the people that were there for me just screaming, hooting, and hollering, which is awesome. That's and a, just sweet. being able to make your debut in your hometown and then strike out, you know, who at the time was their hometown hero in Korea, that, you know, that was an amazing feeling. And then the next day, kind of doing the same thing, that was kind of my wake up. That was honestly my wake up moment in the big leagues was because of the situation I was in, like I said, runners were on base. I had gotten somebody out, and then I gave up. I think I walked the guy, and then I gave up a hit is what it was. Well, the hit was kind of like a blooper in between hit. Nobody was really sure what the ball was going to fall. So, like, I immediately just took off the home plate. The ball fell. One run scored, but, like, I was, like, just get to a spot. I sprinted behind home plate, and I kind of, like, jumped into, like, the the brick wall that's right there in Houston behind it, and I was on the net. And it, there were just people just screaming in my face, <laughs> just screaming and yelling. I'm like, man, this is this is unreal. But at the same time, it was really cool because it's like you get you're in that spot and you look up and around and you're like you're just looking up at the stadium like this is this is awesome and it, it was that moment itself you know kind of taught me a lot real quick and you know, I was able to get out of that situation like I said we still had the lead but especially just making that in your hometown and seeing all your friends and family after talking to everybody taking pictures it was really cool. Yeah, I love it. It's such an awesome story. Uh, before I dive into the last question I ask every guest, I got to ask, uh, what was it like seeing Shohei Otani play on a day-in, day-out basis? I just <laughs> got to know. <laughs> right. So watching it, watching him pitch was one thing. You know, Like I said, I actually came in after him that game on the, my, the back-to-back day, my second game. And, you know, I, I, don't think he, I don't think he was doing both at the same time in the same game. I think they only would have him pitch at a time before then. So... He had pitched, you know, he was he was pitching fine that game and whatnot. And then being able to watch him pitch in other games, it was like, you know, he's going six, seven innings for us. Like, man, this is awesome. He's throwing, he's anywhere from 97 to 100. And then there's other times in few, in like the first few innings where he's like 93, 95. And it's like, this is what he does. He just likes to hang out on cruise control. And then he has the 98, 99, 101 in his back pocket whenever he wants, which, you know, that's just amazing to have. And then you watch him hit, and it's just loud, just just bomb after bomb after bomb. And I'll never forget in Colorado, it, they took BP, and of course, it was a show to watch him take BP. He put one almost out of the stadium, went on the con, like went onto the concourse, and like hit some one of the concession stands back there. It was insane. I don't know how long, how far that ball actually probably would have traveled if they got it, but it it was nuts. And I'll never forget. This is a short little story. So I remember in, in the end of that year, he's already had got towards U- UCL that year and he wasn't going to pitch the rest of the season, but he still wanted to hit because he knew he was like, I'm going to win rookie of the year. 
So sure enough, we're in tech, we're in Texas playing Arlington. And I remember I'm warm and I'm warm enough. We currently are winning. It's gotta be a six. I think it's like six to two or eight to, or seven to two. I think is what it is. And so I'm warming up. We got a five run lead and going into the bottom of the ninth. And they call and radio down, hey, get so-and-so ready. If we score two more, he's in the game. Anderson's down. Okay. So I'm warming up, and Shohei hits a ball that went just straight – just went straight up into Arlington, what felt like, and just kind of kept going. And the same swing, too, like he hit it off – he hit it, like, off his knee, front leg completely, like, locked out, and it just kept going <laughs> and going. And he hit it probably about eight to ten rows deep. In Arlington, I was like, "What in God's name did it just happen?" <laughs> and I'm like, "I'm well, I'm not pitching now." He just hit a two run jack. So, but <laughs> I remember watching that home run, and I'm just like, "It seriously, it went the the way the whole swing went." It, I'm sure his helmet fell off too, and everything. But just the way it was, like, it was on a knee, leg just ended up was locked out, and the ball went over the fence. And I remember, I remember that moment so vividly in my my head because I was like, "Well, I'm I'm done for the night." <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. that's that was one of those things watching him hit like that. It was just unreal. Yeah, I feel like I always have to, to ask, of, especially for guys who have played with him, just because I feel like a lot of baseball fans kind of take it for granted. I don't think they realize mm-hmm. what they're getting to see day in and day out on the baseball field from him. It's, yeah. it's just incredible. I, th- I, I think we're getting to a point, not just with Shohei, but I think with just baseball in general, where we're going to have to get fans to start signing waivers to see yeah. the stands. I mean, <laughs> he's over here. He's over here hitting balls consistently at one fifteen on a line at stadiums. You know, you got guys like Stanton who can talk. Who's hit, I think hit the highest he's hit yeah. one twenty one. I th- no, I know it was the double play ball, but I mean, he's still hit some rockets out at one eighteen, one nineteen. It's like this is getting ridiculous. So when you see guys like that with that just insane amount of juice just crush a ball like that it, it, in the sound the sound is what's terrifying it just it literally sounds like it just a shotgun just went off at home plate and it's like dear god yeah the fact that they still let kids feel during the home run derby and catch <laughs> i'm just like seriously you're just setting that up for disaster i know and i the, the one kid what was it two, <laughs> is it last year or two years ago a kid actually got hurt it's like yeah you mm-hmm. know this is this is this is on y'all y'all chose to put children out there and let grown men hit baseballs as hard <laughs> as they can at them that yeah. that's y'all's fault <laughs> yeah and now it's like they're still using metal in the college level and even those guys at this point are just oh, absurd exit velocities. I am, I am team advocate. We need one home run derby in our lifetime with the the, the baser bats. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. would bring man, them I back. That's so bad. Just for one home run derby, I got to see some guys hit balls. Probably one, got to be one forty at least. Maybe some one fifties in there. Because if they're just hit doing this with a wood bat and you put those trampoline bats in their hands, dear God, yeah, that would be. Maybe. That's what I got. That's what I need to see. <laughs> seeds, seeds is an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah insane i love it uh so for the last question that we always ask guys um we want this an opportunity for fans to get to know the players behind the performances on the field but for future athletes who might be going through some of the same struggles that you've gone through we want to Mm -hmm. kind of be an opportunity for them to learn too so if you had one piece of advice for any younger guy who might be going through some of the same struggles that you had or having some of the same experiences that you had what would that one piece of advice be I think with everything that I've kind of said and touched on, I think it would probably would be just be open, be as open minded as you can. You know, you don't have to take everything that somebody says and use it. You can take bits and pieces and you can take bits and pieces from, I can take bits and pieces from you. I can take bit, bits and pieces from PJ and combine them and have a success that way. So yeah. I definitely think that's probably one of the, the one of the best things is be open minded and you have to find what works for you. And you are going to find different things that different people say that work for you. And that, you know, that that's just, I think that's the nature of the game. And I kind of think, I think the younger generation of players are really good at that, actually. And I actually think the younger generation of players are better at telling coaches now that, you know, this is too much for me or I need a little more of this and whatnot. So I think that's one thing I probably didn't do enough in younger in my career. And now I'm, it's it's a lot easier and guys i mean other coaches and uh, ex- not executives what am i trying to say like farm directors and stuff understand that that i know what i need they know what i need i know what's expected of me and they know what's expected of me so i definitely would say just having that more of an open mind be a little more vulnerable with stuff and tell people what you actually need to help you in your career to get where you want to get to most most definitely 
Yeah, I love it. I think that's an amazing thing to end on. Uh, Justin, we can't thank you enough for taking time out of your evening to join us. Uh, we're wishing you nothing but success the rest of the off season, no matter where you end up, and hoping we get to see you on a major league mound here soon. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me.